Uh, first up is Rebecca Champagne, and she's a PhD candidate at the University of Maine studying environmental science. And she's going to be talking to us today about weed control in organic operations. She has a bachelor's degree in sustainable agriculture from the University of Maine and a master's in agron agronomy from Penn State. Her research focuses on physical and cultural organic weed management, and her work with farmers has ranged from large corn and soybean producers to small organic vegetable farms. After graduation, she plans to pursue work in agricultural and food systems policy and advocacy. And I'll introduce our second speaker in this session as well, um, Andrew Manns of Manns Organics. Andrew is an organic farmer growing field and greenhouse vegetables, organic field and greenhouse vegetables, cover crops, and cereals near Coldale, Alberta. His passion lies in regenerative agriculture with the intent of having the farm produce healthy food while improving the soil and the farm's ecosystem as a whole. He feels that the regenerative approach to farming is sustainable, profitable and enjoyable. And after we've had both presentations, then uh, we will take questions, but please uh, ensure you put those in the in the chat box so that we have them teed up um, at the end of the presentations. So now over to you, Rebecca. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I, I apologize, I'm on the tail end of a cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I might have to stop and take some um, water breaks, but I'm just happy that it is not COVID. <laughs> <laughs> And I have the energy to do this today. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Marla. Um, so my name is Rebecca Champagne. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Maine. Um, I do have a French last name. My grandfather um, was born and raised in Quebec, um, but I, I don't speak French. Um, but yeah, today I'm going to be talking about some research that we've been doing at UMaine the past few years, um, some different, different physical weed control strategies, and then also some seed bank management that um, we've been doing. So just to give you a little bit of a background um, about what organic agriculture looks like in the state of Maine, um, we have a lot of young, we have a lot of beginning farmers. Um, we currently have about 500 organic farms that's on about 55,000 acres. Um, and this has been increasing every year for the past couple decades. Um, and we currently rank 10th in the United States for our organic crop sales at about $65 million per year. And we deal with everything from small scale vegetable growers, uh, people who do just farm stands, uh, to really large, um, really large organic farms in the northern part of the state who do potatoes and broccoli and, and blueberries, things like that. So a lot of the farmers that we work with um, use mostly hand tools, uh, the picture on the left different kinds of hand tools, uh, walk behind tractors, and then if they are at a scale that allows it, um, many farmers also will purchase these steerable uh, cultivation units to put behind their tractors. Um, but I'd say that the majority of the farms that we work with are using um, hand tools or a combination of hand tools and smaller walk behind tractors. So the research I'll be talking about today kind of does, a, you'll see you'll see when we get into it, but kind of does a little bit of, of both, mostly tractor work, but stuff that's also applicable to a small scale where just hand tools are being used. So one of the biggest issues we deal with in organic production is that the weeds growing in the crop row are generally really hard to control. <clears throat> Excuse me. We know that weeds in the, uh, between the crop rows, so we call this the inter-row zone, uh, these weeds are generally pretty easy to kill. Um, we can take a, a harrow or some s tines and go through our field and kill these weeds pretty easily. But this leaves a nice little strip of weeds right around the crop or the intra row area. So this is just the area directly surrounding the crop row. Um, so this is often where hand weeding has to occur. Um, and if you want to cultivate closer to your crop row to kill these weeds, you have to be a little bit more aggressive and that can often mean um, higher crop mortality, especially in more sensitive or, or smaller crops, which are often the ones that are more high value um, that we don't want to kill. <laughs> so research on the efficacy of cultivation, so the percent of the weeds that are killed, has shown that um, the mean efficacy is often between 50 to 60, 65 percent or so, um, but also has a lot of variability. Um, so ranges from literally zero to 100%. 
So this is data from um, a study done by my advisor, Dr. Eric Gallant. Um, well, 10, 10 years ago now at uh, our research farm. And he found that if he, he had 139 um, sampling areas across a very large organically managed field. Um, and it was planted to a crop. It was oversown with some um, wild mustard that you'll see here. Um, we use this sometimes in our studies because we know that it grows really fast and it germinates very reliably. And it also has similar characteristics to a lot of other really common um, annual broadleaf species. So, um, and then him and his team of students went out and cultivated, and then they counted the weeds that were there before cultivation and there were after. And even across an entire large organically managed field, there was still a lot of variability in the number of weeds that survived. And he found an average of about 67%, but then like I said, this very large variability. Another issue is that cultivation acts independent of the density of weeds that you have out in the field. Meaning in any particular area, it does not matter how many weeds you have, um, cultivation is going to kill a certain percent every single time. Um, so if we take this idea, <clears throat> excuse me, this idea of 67%, um, let's say in one area we have 40 weeds and we cultivate, 33% are going to survive and we'll have about 13 weeds left in that one area. Now we could always go back in and cultivate again. And then in that same area, we would maybe have three or four weeds left. Um, but we know that cultivating multiple times over the season is one, not great for the soil, uh, two, takes up time and labor, and three, uh, we know that we can't always get into the field when we want to. So these weeds could be really small, white thread to color leading stage when we are getting 67% efficacy. But by the time we get down here, these weeds may be very large and there's no sense in cultivating because we're not going to kill them. They need to be pulled by hand because they're just going to reroot themselves. So some solutions that we always think of uh, when it comes to increasing that efficacy. Um, so like I showed in this past slide, we could always cultivate more, um, but that's not always something that a farmer wants to do or can do. We know that it's very busy during the summer. Maybe you can't get into the field when you want to. You have a lot of other things going on. Um, but what if we were cultivating better to begin with, and then also starting with fewer weeds? So if you think about that picture with the 40 weeds in it, if there were fewer of those to begin with and we killed a higher percentage of them, then there's fewer weeds after cultivating. So we don't want to cultivate more. So the two things I'll be focusing on are cultivating better and then also starting with fewer weeds. So one thing I'll be talking about is the idea of tool stacking. So this is using more than one tool, a cultivation tool at the same time on your toolbar, or if you do not have the ability to um, attach multiple tools onto your toolbar to then come through the second pass in the field immediately after with a different kind of tool. Um, and I'll show some examples of, of research about this, but this can help reduce the number of surviving weed seedlings, which helps reduce weed seed rain. So what if we uh, combine this with seed bank management, like tarping or flame weeding? Um, this can also help reduce weed seedlings and then reduce seed rain. And then when we come with our tool stacking, it kind of creates this like virtuous cycle of sorts um, that we think can really drive down the, the weed seed bank over time. So I'm going to start with the seed bank management. We like to think about the weed seed bank as, as like, like a bank, but instead of maximizing uh, what we want in our, seed, in our seed bank, we actually want to minimize it. So we want to minimize our credits, minimize the amount of weed seeds that are going into the soil, and we want to maximize our debits or removing those seeds from the soil, either through predation or seed decay um, or encouraging those weeds to kill uh, to germinate and then killing them when they're small. So my advisor, Dr. Eric Gallant, um, coined this term, many little hammers, meaning that rather than a silver bullet approach to killing weeds, 
So maybe instead of just relying on cultivation, we want to use multiple different stressors throughout the season that are going to um, reduce the number of surviving seedlings and then reduce our seed rain. So we want to target weeds when they're small. We, don't, we do not want them to reach seed production. Uh, so if we can manage the seed bank and encourage weeds to germinate and kill them when they're small, we will prevent the seed rain from occurring. There are also practices that can be done to um, encourage seed predation, like cover cropping to give an environment for beneficial arthropods that eat seeds, or even things like field mice. Um, but the point is that we want these seeds that are in the top uh, five to 10 centimeters or so of the soil, we, we actually want to encourage them to germinate early in the season and then kill them when they're really small so that when we plant our crop, we have fewer weeds to deal with. So one research project that we've been working on the past few years is looking at um, seed bank management versus no seed bank management. The no seed bank management meaning just relying on cultivation. Um, so in the uh, treatments where we are doing seed bank management, we are applying these six millimeter black silage tarps um, for about five to seven weeks before we plant our crop. So I'm, I'm not familiar with what the weather is like in April and May in your region, um, but for us, it's generally pretty wet, <laughs> cold and wet. So <clears throat> we kind of have a hard time getting into the field before middle to end of April. Um, but when we can, we work the field, we try to get rid of any sort of um, cover crop or winter annual weed residue, we harrow the field. So this is what's important before silage tarping is that you want to stimulate weeds germinate. And then you put the tarps down. So the tarps um, do not, because they're black plastic, they do not allow the photosynthetically active light that the weeds need to grow um, to actually penetrate through the plastic into the soil. So the weeds have just received some sort of cue to germinate when you've prepped your field. Um, they germinate and they come up under the tarp and nowhere to go. So they just die under the tarp. Um, so you can tarp for as long as you want. Four weeks is about the minimum that you'd want to do, but you can do up to seven or eight. Um, this can be really useful if you're doing like a, a late sown uh, fall crop, like a late carrot or something. Um, you could put these tarps on for a long time and then just leave them be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So after we pull our tarps off, we do our regular seed bed prep, we harrow again, um, we form our beds, we plant our crop, and then we flame weed um, before our crop comes up. So this will vary based on the emergence of whatever crop we have. Um, but the goal is we've done some sort of shallow tillage that encourages weeds to come up, but before the crop comes up, we go through with the flame weeder and we kill those weeds. So in these treatments, we came back through and counted the number of weeds that were in the crop row 14 days after we planted. And we found that where we did this tarping and flame weeding, we reduced our weed densities in the crop row by four times. We had about 12 weeds in a square meter in the crop row. Um, and then we also did a timed hand weeding event, and we found that we were able to reduce that hand weeding labor by 50%. So we also took some seed bank samples um, every spring and then grew them out in the greenhouse. So uh, basically we just take a bunch of soil samples, we sieve the soil to get large clods and rocks and residue out, um, and then we grow them over vermiculite in flats in our, in our greenhouse. And then we uh, count and ID all the different weed seedlings that come up. Um, so I think this, this image is pretty uh, striking of what, of what the tarping and the flame weeding can do. So um, on the left, this is where we've done just cultivation. And then on the right, that is where we've included the tarping and the flame weeding. And it's, it's visually pretty striking. And this is a picture of what it looks like in the field. So this is on the day that we are taking the tarps off. Um, on the right, that's where a tarp has just been removed. It looks very clean. Uh, and then on the left, that's where we did all of our usual field prep, but we didn't put down any tarps. Um, and one thing I would like to point out about this picture is that the weeds here are, are pretty big. Um, and if you think about the, the field prep you need to do before planting, 
you might have to disc and harrow a few times to get these weeds because they're so large. Um, and at that point, you're probably going to have some that are still going to survive, and then they're going to be much, much larger than your crop. Water break. <clears throat> so the um, other concept I'll be talking about is tool stacking. So the red line kind of indicates where your crop row would be. Um, the idea behind tool stacking <clears throat> is that you're going to use more than, <clears throat> excuse me, more than one tool at the same time, as indicated in this picture, or if you do not have a unit this large where you can attach multiple tools, um, then you would come back through the second pass with a different tool. So the idea here, so here we've got some pine harrows, some fingers, uh, torsion weeders, and then we always try to include some sort of sweep in the front because that helps break any sort of soil crust that could be going on. Um, and kind of loosens things up a bit for the tools that are behind it. Um, so the idea is that you're using tools that have different modes of action. They have different ways of killing weeds. Um, they act through burial or uprooting um, or severing the roots from the shoots. So <clears throat> that's the idea behind using more than one tool. So this picture, um, shows one of my advisors, former PhD students who started this tool stacking work. Um, and they found that using more than one tool could help increase the number of weeds that you kill, but also reduce that variability around the mean. So if you think back to the image I showed where the, the mean efficacy was about 65%, but also very variable, um, they found that when you used two tools and then even three tools, that you could increase efficacy and then shrink this variability down. So you're not only killing more weeds, but you're killing more weeds more often and um, not having as much variability. And another cool thing I'll point out um, from that study is that they also found evidence of synergy. So when you use each tool individually, that's on the left side of this graph, you get a certain uh, percent efficacy. And then there is a formula that you can use each of these individual efficacies, and it will tell you what the expected efficacy would be if you used all three together. Uh, and then what they actually observed in the field, in their field study, was higher than that expected value, um, meaning that these tools were synergistic and actually killed more weeds than was actually expected. And it was consistently killing almost 90% of the weeds, which is pretty impressive considering that um, on the non-organic side that most herbicide programs are, are similar to that as well. So in our setup, so we're uh, building off of that tool stacking work and just repeating it. So um, in these pictures, you can see we've got our sweeps in the front and then we've got a time hero. These are used to kill the weeds, well, one, to break the crust, and then to kill the weeds that are between the crop rows. So we kept that similar in all of our treatments. Now, where it was different was with the tools that we used to target in the crop row. So um, these finger weeders were used in all of our treatments to kill the weeds in the crop row, but in our tool stacking, we also came back through and used these hoe ridgers. So these act very similarly to hilling discs. Um, so you can adjust them both in towards the crop row or out if you don't want to hill as aggressively. Uh, and then these little wings on the side that are bolted on can also be adjusted um, further in or out along the crop row. So basically as these triangles move through the soil, they push the soil up into a ridge around the crop row. Um, and we were, we were really impressed with how these worked. We'd only ever used hilling discs, um, but we found that these um, hoeragers were e more easily adjustable um, and weren't quite as, a, and therefore just like not as aggressive in their hilling actions. So we could adjust it in just a little tiny bit and then get that little ridge of soil to close over the crop without just completely like burying it. <laughs> Um, so this is very similar to the work that was previously done. We found that when we did this tool stacking, 
we consistently achieved greater than 85% lead control um, and the variability was very low. So we did this over three years in three different crops, um, sweet corn, bush bean, and table beet. We wanted to see how this would work in a spectrum of crops. You know, we've got corn, which is pretty uh, hardy. Um, we've got table beet, which is very small. <laughs> um, and it did not increase crop mortality in any of these crops compared to using just the finger weeders by themselves. Um, and we also observed less than 10% crop mortality. Um, which we thought was, was pretty good. So all that being said, <clears throat> we wanted to know, can tool stacking work with hand tools? So we um, partnered with Johnny's Selected Seeds, which is based here in Maine, um, and a company called TerraTech, which is out of France. Uh, I'm unfamiliar if they have any distributors in Canada or not, but they uh, this product can be purchased through Johnny Selected Seeds. Um, so we did some studies with the Paratech double wheel hoe. So if you're familiar with a traditional wheel hoe that would have the blade on the bottom that we, you would use to um, run between your crop rows. Um, this is built very similarly to that. Um, it's got your adjustable handles, it's got the wheels, um, but and then you can also buy different toolbars and different tools. And if you notice in this picture on the bottom right, there's a second toolbar attachment. So you have the ability to use more than one tool and use that tool stacking concept. Um, and I'll also point out that these tools, these discs with the side knives, the finger weeders, the harrows, those are tools that are typically only available for a tractor mounted cultivation unit. Um, so they are, you know, obviously they're smaller, maybe not as um, beefy as the ones you'd attach to a tractor, um, but the concept is there, the idea of being able to stack the tools. So this wheel hoe itself costs about 465 US dollars. Uh, and then you can purchase whichever tools you want or don't want, different toolbars, um, and the tools run about 100 to 250 dollars for the, the set. So here's a picture of me using it in a field a couple years ago. Um, this is not an, an endorsement of any of any sorts, um, but I will say that this was really fun to use. It was easy to use. Um, I'd say the only thing I didn't like was that you had to assemble it yourself. <laughs> it came in a box with all the parts and like the instructions, like you're setting up a piece of furniture. <laughs> um, but after that, it was it was great. Um, it's these little toolbars that you can attach the tool onto, they're on an, a notched system. Um, so there's no fiddling with wrenches or, or anything. Um, you just unscrew the top, you slide it along the notch on the toolbar to the, the distance that you want, and then you screw it back into place. Um, it provides about seven inches of clearance over the crop. So this is meant to be used when your crop is still pretty small. Um, but here on this bed system where we've got two rows of beans planted, um, you can see that I'm very easily walking between the two rows. Um, and we've also had some farmers in the state try this out on a three row bed system in onions, um, in small lettuce, and have been very impressed with it. Um, we did have a farmer trying this out. He used this uh, down a three row bed of onions, um, I believe it was about 300 feet long and he did it in under five minutes. Um, and he was just like, wow, the time it would take me to hand weed all that is, is so much more than, <laughs> more than uh, just using this. Um, so obviously you may still have to do some hand weeding after you use this tool, but the fact that it has the ability to attach um, a second tool on there is, is a really cool concept. So we want to know, let's see, um, somebody's not on mute, sorry. Um, so we figured out how many tool combinations can we do? We did, there's six single tools that you can purchase for this Paratech. We looked at the efficacy of all of those, and then we looked at all the possible two and three tool combinations. And this is a very similar pattern to what was found with the tractor mounted tools. Um, so where we added a second or a third tool on, we increased our efficacy. 
Um, you will notice that this efficacy is a bit lower than what was observed with tractor mounted tools. Like I said, these tools are a bit smaller, uh, not as aggressive as something that you're going to mount onto a tractor, obviously. Um, but this is pretty impressive that you can still stack tools and then you can observe greater efficacy. Uh, so we did this in bush bean and we found that we did not increase crop mortality when we did our tool stacking and we also had comparable yields at the end of the season. So we are excited to do more work with this um, and work with Paratech and Johnny's seeds a bit more. So I'm pretty much out of, yeah, I think I'm right on uh, right at the end of my time. So um, here's our website, umaine.edu slash weed ecology. And then my advisor also has a YouTube channel uh, called Zero Seed Rain. And um, I know I'll be taking questions at the end, um, but if you have questions outside of this presentation, my email is here on the screen. So please feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Rebecca. Sorry, I just I lost my Zoom there for a minute. <laughs> it was an excellent presentation, and uh, we really appreciate you being here. And thank you for uh, sticking around so that we can get our questions in after Andrew. So Andrew uh, Mann is up next, Mans, and over to you. All right. Good morning. Can everybody see this? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I guess I just put together a good handful of, of pictures really showing the practical aspect of what we use on the farm. So yes, I'm Andrew with Man's Organics. We farm here in Southern Alberta and we grow strictly organic crops. We grow one acre of organic greenhouse vegetables and then about 30 acres of field vegetables. So we focus or our, our business is really growing fresh produce. And so, yes, weed control is, is one of our, our big challenges. And uh, we're in a climate, we're under irrigation with, with pivots, with overhead irrigation. We have um, the famous Southern Alberta wind. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. But uh, yeah, we grow onions, garlic. Those are two of our larger crops. We also grow squash and cantaloupe watermelons the the field vegetables and we have been growing a little bit of spring wheat but it looks like we're getting out of that to focus just on the vegetables and of course in between the vegetables we're growing quite a few cover crops so i wanted to the weed control or a big or the most important aspect i think is that we focus on the soil health and the soil structure and and all of that as a uh a, not in, in a sense a tool right a tool that's not a physical tool but something that gives us the soil health and, and allows our crops to be strong and vigorous where the weeds don't thrive where we can reduce our, our seed bank and i'm going to uh highly recommend uh, Glenn Ravenberg with Soil Works, or even the connection with uh, Back to Your Roots or Hybrix Manufacturing. Um, and borrowing Glenn's words, he always talks about the ABCs of soil. So he's talking about the air, the biology, and the carbon. And I think that I won't go into detail, but that really sums up what we need to focus on from that taking a step back from you know the day-to-day -day weed control in your crops, but really to build build that soil health. So we use uh, various ideas or processes on the left hand of the screen you can see a picture we're actually injecting a an extract along with some nutrition through our pivot onto a cover crop and that's just a basic thought process to increase the diversity of the biology to put minerals let's say like a micronized gypsum out or even boron or uh, molasses or even a little bit of fish uh, uh, fish hydrolysis and what we're after is a good soil structure that allows that in and out of of that gas exchange for the life of the biology and growing healthy plants and uh, you can see an idea of, of when things like that start to happen we see a lot of more uh, populations of worms and just good biology happening around the root zones 
first off on the practical aspect of weed control is we um, do harrowing. So blind harrowing, this is showing two different examples of, of it on uh, spring wheat. And it is a very effective tool. This just disturbs all of the soil. It, uh, one note on that is I uh, find it very stressful. <laughs> Experience will begin to tell you what, what you can and can't do. But when you go into what looks like a, a beautiful, nice green spring wheat crop and, and you literally turn it brown, you think, what am I doing? But uh, the wheat is pretty resilient. We do seed heavy for that reason. But uh, the idea is if, if the wheat is coming strong, which is again, relating to, um, to soil health and, and even we put biological seed treatments on the wheat, the, the theory is get this wheat to be as strong and, and quick as possible. So that is at least ahead or stronger than your weeds and then when you come in for a harrowing pass like this the weeds are smaller and you can you can hit them hard enough um, so yeah this looks very brown but in in a few days three to five days it'll it'll come back you do do a percentage of of damage to the wheat but we've seed heavy enough for that so that's an example there this doesn't have as much of a it's a little bit more difficult to apply to vegetables um, especially our, our onions are a challenge. They're spring seeded and, and so small. So they, they never have a, a strong enough uh, crop plant to actually take a heroin aggressively like this. Here's some pictures of our, our inter-row and in-row process. Uh, these are on garlic. So we have a machine which we, we can steer via hydraulics. So we do put a employee on, on the machine. So we use a hydraulic system to steer and we can see the, the finger weeders or the torsion tines. That is for the weeds that will be in the row, the intra-row weeds. And then we've got a set of S tines which are running uh, and, and based on parallelograms. So we run quite shallow and that way our, our thought process is that if we keep our cultivations very shallow just within the top half inch we're killing weeds and yet we're not uh, disturbing the soil structure below to greater depths and just scuffing the top every time to disturb what uh, what is just starting to grow or maybe small weeds. One thing to point out on all of this is that timing in, in all of this is, is very critical. There's no not really much room for error. This is timing to, to a day, not days, not weeks. It's even sometimes hours. Uh, a hot afternoon versus a cool, moist morning will make a big difference on, on how quick the weeds die or, or the survival rate. So timing and, and being on time is very important. Here's another example of an older machine we have. This was a home-built one, a same idea. We use the the tines and the finger weeders to weed in the row and same thing just a hydraulic steering system these ones were were not a parallelogram based we we had the fingers in the back actually riding on the soil and height was less of a something that we can control well so this one this machine would tend to to go at different heights depending on the soil conditions Another tool for us, and this is on onion actually, is flame weeding before the emergence of the crop. So this is a very, very big tool in onions. We seed our onions typically sometime in April and give them several small irrigations for germination. And at this point, we typically have been running a more of a disturbed field. So we would prep our beds in the, in the spring, as you can see on the left side here. And then uh, with those small irrigations, you've got quite a flush of weeds coming and they can be burned off quite successfully before or days before, hours before the uh, onions come up. And that way you've, you've made, um, you know, 50% or a real big portion of, of that first flush anyways is killed by the flaming. 
on the right hand, you'll see an action picture from last year. We did not do a spring bed prep. So we had a cover crop in and we, we direct seeded. I believe I have a picture of that seeding operation later. And so there was a lot more residue when we flamed, which, which burned away, which is okay for our uh, next passes with in-row or inter-row cultivation. But that was a, a less successful um, flaming. You can see also on our flamer here, we rebuilt our our shield in the back so we could, uh, it was a very sensitive to wind. And in Southern Alberta here, we have a lot of breezy days. So this shield here made it a possible for us to flame in, in winds of up to 30 or 40 kilometers an hour yet and still do it successfully. And also uh, drive faster. So decrease our propane consumption per acre. Uh, what we have underneath here is liquid propane torches, which are bought from a company. The rest of this machine was built by ourselves. But there's uh, about 8 million BTUs underneath this shield on seven feet. So there's a lot of energy and it, every, every, uh, everything that is dead, if it's an annual, like a broadleaf, they're gone. Things like a wheat or a grass, they're, they're challenges because they can pop back up from this. <clears throat> These are pictures of, of what happens after that. Then once the onions are up, we start weeding with uh, our solar powered home bill weeder. So we have three employees will lay inside. Uh, they can shelter as much or as little as needed, but they lay in and actually physically hand weed the in row. So onions, as you can see, these are about inch and a half, two inches tall, and they're just very delicate. So we've not been able to, to find a, an operation that we can, we can mechanically weed without doing a lot of damage to that young onion crop. So hand weeding is the, is the challenge here. And it's, it's definitely our biggest hand weeding challenge. Some years it's a lot of hours. Uh, I saw Rebecca had some figures there that kind of seemed to add up. We've had, a, had as extreme as about 200 hours per acre, which is too much and, and it takes us too much time and we struggle. But uh, 100 hours is, I would say, even realistic, ideally 50 for hand weeding where we can stay on top of it. But that's, uh, there's definitely a cost and it's it's a time crunch trying to get through. We grow about seven acres of onions and it's a real time crunch to get through them on time and, and actually make multiple passes. So another practice we have for the squash and melons is to use plastic mulch. So there's a, a four foot piece of plastic and the drip line is underneath. So it's really nice for irrigation. It's really uh, effective on how much water the crop uh, uses or the efficiency of that water. Now, one of our challenges again is, is making sure that this gets laid soil because of our winds. And the last thing we need is plastic blowing around when the crop is young or, or not even in. And it is a good system. There's a couple of disadvantages. One is you're using plastic, which is good for one year, and then you have to put effort in to clean it up again. The other disadvantage is that you still really have to focus on the weeding on the edges of the plastic mulch. So if it rains, the water runs on the edge, you get a nice moist area on the edge of the mulch, and that is where all the little weeds grow, which we control mechanically, but now you're working right next to a thin layer of plastic, which you don't want to disturb or cut into. So it kind of, it keeps the challenge away of weeding from the crop, which we transplant into the, the center, either transplants or direct seeding with, with squash. But it, it kind of adds another challenge of, of weeding on this very small edge here. Anything close by the plastic within an inch is the challenge. Anything farther than an inch away is, is relatively not too difficult with machinery. So another practice, this isn't necessarily directly the weed control again, this is more the, the general practice on, on the, the seed bank and the soil fertility and soil health. So our, our standard practice, if you want to call it that, for cover crops is we grow a cover crop which we terminate in, in about the third week of July. So we seed a cover crop about mid-May, May 10th to 20th or so, and then we let that grow. That's a somewhere in the range of about a 15 to 20 species mix. We let that grow, get a good bit of biomass, and then we terminate that using a rototiller 
quite shallow, quite fast, and it's a single pass for effective kill. We then let that crop material dry out for a few days to make sure. And then we'll actually put some water on with our pivots. And when we put the water on, the, the earthworms and the biology really fires up and it digests that crop. And about three weeks later, we seed what we call our fall cover crops, which are less species and all species that will be killed by our winters. So just to make sure that we have cover going into the fall and winter again, mostly for wind, snow catch, but that way those crops are all dead in the spring when we're coming for our other vegetable operations. So this is what it looks like a couple of weeks after that termination. There's still residue on the top and sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the species and, and how things grew that year. And we'll just come right in with a disc drill and seed our fall, what we call our fall blend right through that and uh, put water on it again. So I guess that's definitely one of our advantages <clears throat> being in, in the um, irrigation district here in Southern Alberta is that we can somewhat uh, more control water when we need it. So this is actually the pictures of our um, Stan Hay. This is a vacuum seeder for onions or for other vegetables. We're using it for onions here. And this is what we did last spring to plant directly into the residue of a cover crop. So we put in a just a disc to cut any residue that might be laying across and then a small small fixed shovel, a flat shovel, just to <clears throat> clean that row and then flatten out the soil for the uh, the rollers and, and the, the Stan Hay seeder. Now the, the seeding went okay, but with this cover crop did have a few, what we feel like was probably a few too many weeds that I think had viable seed. And uh, this was not the cleanest year. It was actually a challenging year on, on weed control. And they Uh, this crop here. So this is my last slide. This is a picture of what we're what we're trying, and we've actually taken that same strip tillage procedure, but we applied it into our fall cover crop, and we hope to plant onions there this year. So rather than disturbing that soil and and killing that cover crop and doing that or uh, making the, the seed bed as we were seeding in the spring, we decided to, to pre get those strips made in the later in the fall and actually have uh, weeds and whatnot in that little layer grow in the fall. And then hopefully in the spring we're cleaner, but we still want the cover, cover for the winter, <clears throat> fall and winter, for the, um, especially for the winds with the soil erosion and everything blowing around. Um, on that note, like, you can check out our website and see our social media links. We try to post some pictures. I'd like to say that it's uh, it's a practical challenge. It's a big challenge, and we're we're still learning. So throwing some ideas out there and some pictures of what we do, and not that everything works every time. Um, you're as a farmer, you are the the expert of your farm, and and being there and hands on is is key. And just um, knowing from experiences what works and what doesn't work, but being willing to try. And always kind of thinking on your toes because every season is different. If moisture changes, one tool may not work. You might have to switch to another tool. And timing is critical. You, you just, especially in those high value vegetable crops, um, problems start or happen quick. So you've got to be beforehand. We've always kind of said that you should be weeding when you don't think you need to be because when you really realize you need to be, you're actually too late. So go when, when it's not a problem and it won't problem when you've got problems they they can continue to grow so anyways that's uh that's my two bits so i don't know where we're at on time but uh i can go back and we can take questions that sounds great thank you andrew and you're right right on time actually so that that was that's perfect thank you so much um so we'll invite rebecca back as well we've had a few questions come into the chat box uh, while you've been uh speaking and the first one is for rebecca and the question is thinking about how low till or thinking about low till methods, how deep do the tools go that were used stacked, both the tractor mounted and the Terra Tech mounted? Terra Tech, yeah. Great question. Um, so I'll start with the with the Terra Tech. Um, 
The TerraTech being a hand tool does not have the same <clears throat> kind of depth control that you would get with a tractor mounted tool. Um, that being said, it only run the tools only run about an eighth to a quarter of an inch deep. Um, we did do some initial testing with these tools where we stuck wooden dowels into the soil in the crop row and marked with a sharpie on the soil level. And then after we cultivated, we looked and looked at soil movement. Uh, and then we, we put some down further into the soil to measure exactly like the depth that they went to. And it wasn't anything more than a quarter of an inch. Um, for the tractor mounted tools, um, the, the sweeps that I showed you on the, on the front um, actually had a uh, the ability to control the depth. So they had um, a ruler on the side built onto the sweeps where you could adjust to whatever depth you wanted. And then when you're on a flat surface, you would drop the sweep down and uh, screw it into place. And then it has a, a depth wheel in front of it that helps control that. So we were purposely setting those to be a half inch um, and that's really as, as deep as we wanted to go. Um, but we were also, of course, being on a research farm, we have the ability to more carefully control when we're trying to cultivate. So our weeds were usually less than one true leaf. Um, if you have an instance where you can't get into the field right away and your weeds get a little bit bigger, you might have to cultivate a little bit deeper to, uh, to kill them. So like, like Andrew said, it's, you know, sometimes when you, you should be cultivating when you don't think you should be cultivating. Um, we we can definitely get into the field a little bit easier than than an actual farmer. You know, we're, I'll, I'll admit that we're a research farm, so we're very carefully uh, monitoring when we want to cultivate. Um, but but even, you know, even then, we definitely have had times where we said, oh, yeah, the weather looks great tomorrow. We'll cultivate tomorrow. And then uh, thunderstorms. <laughs> So, um, but back to the original question, we, yes, we ran these at about a half inch, the tractor mounted tools, um, and the depth wheel on it helps, help control and they float too. So, um, if you go over a part of the field where it's maybe rockier or uneven ground, it would still stay at a half inch. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and the next one is for uh, Andrew, what is your experience in terms of damage to garlic using finger weeders? Yeah, um, one, one thing to note with, with all tools and finger weeders included is that there is a lot of uh, options on adjustability and how aggressive or, or not aggressive. So that's the same thing. It's a balance with every stage of the crop. Um, with the finger weeders, you can run them closer together. Speed makes a big difference, ground pressure. So they work well and they work well for garlic. Now it's the same thing. You've got to be in that crop before and after, and then you can say, okay, we can, you know, I see damage or I don't see damage. I'm getting weed. The sweet spot, right? So yeah, they work well. I think damage is fine, but that being said, um, I think it can be set wrong and do damage, and it can be set to not do damage but not kill weeds. So then it, your futile effort. So everything is is immensely adjustable to yeah to ground speed, and the ground speed is a big one. Soil conditions, so it's wetter, it's drier. Um, the sun is shining, so the weeds that are in that crusty move die today, and tomorrow it's moist and cloudy, so they survive. There's all kinds of variables. Great, thank, thank you, Andrew. Maybe this is a question for both of you. Um, how do you prevent soil compaction due to tractors? Are you using tractors? I can jump in on that. So sure. we, we do drive, uh, I can actually just show you right here, even that this, um, the two, what we call tracks on either side of our beds is, is where the tires drive the entire season. So we're, we're kind of on a, on a row crop or a tram system. It's just, it's small and it's right next to each other. We will occasionally pull a tine, a deeper tine through that to break it up and at least allow the moisture to go in. Um, it's not great, but we're trying to keep it in one spot for the season so that it's not directly affecting the, the crops we're growing. And through the use of, of gypsum and, and maybe a a more aggressive tillage pass after a crop and before a cover crop the next season or in the fall. So for example, garlic is harvested in August. We'll do a deeper cultivation to break up the compaction from the multiple passes and then we'll put in a cover crop to, to ideally get the roots and biology through that soil that's been loosened by tillage 
and and hopefully um, you know regain some of that soil structure. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Did you have anything that you wanted to add? I think I think Andrew covered it. Yeah, we. I mean, we're rotating crops every year, even in our research fields. So, um, and these crops have different row spacing. So every year we're changing where that those tractor wheel paths are. So, um, and then we do have to occasionally do some more intensive tillage to break up large residues. And then we use cover crops as well, uh, especially in fields that are uh, fallow for a year. So well, we've been able to, to avoid compaction issues that way. Perfect, thank you. I mean, this is a question for Andrew. Do you need to have a special permit to do flame weeding? And how do your neighbors feel about you using this method? Um, we've never had a permit for it. We've wondered before, typically in the spring, we're not under fire bans. There's enough moisture, there's enough green crops. It's not the higher risk time of year. Um, we are also an irrigation district. However, uh, when there's a lot of residue and residues go on fire and parts of the field are on fire for a while, it's, it's um, we definitely keep an eye on it. <laughs> We've never had any concerns from the neighbors. It's, it's usually a brief half a day or a day for uh, once in the year. And uh, yeah, hasn't been an issue, but when, when you start to change theories and you have that residue and residues go on fire compared to um, till beds, that's been a concern that we never had in previous years. And now with the residue, it's, it's more of an issue. So definitely something to be careful of, but yeah, never been a problem. And oh, I'll, I'll add something to, to that. Yeah, so we've never had any concerns either, but one thing that I always do just to make sure I've covered my bases is whenever I'm gonna fire up the flame weeder, um, I, call, I call our local fire department. And I just say, hey, this is what we're doing. <laughs> Um, just in case, so they can be so they can be ready to go. Um, so if you're going to do this at your own farm, maybe a good idea just to to have uh, make that quick phone call and just let them know what you're doing. Um, that's my advice. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, oh, and then a question about your last photo, uh, Andrew. Do you remember the seeding date on the cover in your last slide? Yes, I believe it was August, the second week of August, somewhere in the 10th to 15th range or so here. Perfect, thank you. And then uh, the last question so far, often when I say it's the last question, another one will pop in, but it's for Andrew. And it says, what tools do you use for edge of plastic weed control? Yes, that's a, a good question. We've had a, a variety of, of tricks or things we've tried. Initially, we were using a small round disc, concave disc to actually get really close and, and to, to pull that soil away and then another disc to put it back. Um, the problem with that is, is trying to be accurate enough and if depth change or, or if you hit the plastic, you start cutting it. Uh, and the other thing is that when you take that soil away from the plastic, it actually becomes a little bit looser than it was originally, which is less than ideal in our windy conditions. What we've been playing with the last year or two is actually using kind of the same practice, but then we use um, an electric blower and we can actually, when you, when you blow a, a high velocity of air right at the edge, you can actually lift that last little bit of soil right away and then push it back up. So it's just flipping that little bit of crust or soil that's right on that top corner away and and getting it back um but it's a challenge and every year the conditions are different we've tried to seed clovers on the edge and then focus on mowing but we didn't get much for like then we were relying on the rain and we didn't get it and we didn't get clover established and we had weeds and the the catch with with mowing weeds quicker so it was kind of a losing battle, didn't last long enough to be a, a true weed control. And, and another theory we've done, which is a lot more disturbance, is actually to go, to go deeper with uh, just a flat blade and actually go about four inches deep and across to underneath the edge of the plastic. And, then, and that's for bigger weeds. It, doesn't, it won't kill the little weeds that are just growing in the top. But if you get something that's rooted in and it's, it's rooted in all the way down that We're just having some technical issues, Andrew, with your sound. Yeah, I don't 
plastic. It's a lot more disturbing than harder to get in the ground. Right. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So maybe right if you, yeah, if you maybe maybe can you just turn off your uh, camera? Sometimes that helps, and then just say what you just said because it kind of comes yes. in and out. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I got a, a low internet bandwidth warning there, so I've turned my camera okay. off. So yes, I was referring to um, with larger weeds on the edges of the plastic mulch, we have gone with a deeper, I, I want to call it a shank, but it's a homemade flat blade and it goes about four inches, which is below or just at the bottom edge of that buried edge of the mulch. And this is for larger weeds that have rooted through, but it, it, it's a, more of a challenge to get in the ground. You need down pressure. We've actually had that belly mounted on another tractor with, with down pressure on cylinders. And it's a lot more disturbance. But if, if you get weeds that really establish on the edge and you're, so to speak, desperate, <laughs> it is an option. So it, it's definitely one of like on, on the plastic mulch, that that edge of the weeds on the edge, you, you've kind of moved your weed problem over. but now you've, you've got another spot where you still have to worry about and have a bit of a challenge with weeds. So it's a tool, but it, it provides a few other challenges. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll just say going once, going twice for questions. We're running just a little bit ahead of schedule, um, which is, um, will give us, a, which allows for a one, one more question if there is one, but if there isn't and one hasn't, oh. Have you have you used plastic in your garlic production? There, there are last questions that are more for this section. And okay. be, yeah. Yeah, we have not. No. So we we grow, we're up to about 14 acres of garlic now, and it's fall planted. So no, we have never done any any plastic and garlic. It's been strictly the squash and the melons. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. And thank you to Rebecca and Andrew uh, for your presentations today. And, uh, you know, I know where schedules are busy and we appreciate you taking the time to prepare and, and to be here and present and answer our questions. So thank you so much again for your- Thank you for having us. Yeah, brilliant. Yes, thank you.